let us move on to our next speaker, uh, another good friend of mine. I'm so excited to have Tierney Tees joining us. Tierney was smitten with the ocean sunfishes and her research on these glorious fish have taken her all over the world. Along the way though, she's witnessed our plastic pollution footprint and she's seen it growing larger and larger and started learning more about how our clothes are shedding these small plastic fibers every time we put them into the wash. This has led her on a wild global, global adventure, discovering fabrics from our past, present and future and opportunities for finding solutions to our fashion pollution. So I'm gonna bring Tierney in live with us on the West Coast. Hi Tierney, how are you? Hey, good, good to see you, Joe. Um, yeah, great to see you. What an amazing, what amazing festival so far. It has been a wild global ride. I, you know, I've, I've talked about this often in between the breaks. We started the morning in the Philippines. Next, you know, we we're in India and Colombia and the UK, and we just keep moving around. We were in Svalbard already. It's been a, a, just a great day. And it really is an honor to share so many stories uh, with everybody tuning in today. Yeah, and, and such a small carbon footprint doing it. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> awesome, Tierney. Well, I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. Uh, I'm really excited. Uh, for yeah. your presentation, and then I bet you there'll be some questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, well, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here and so thankful to Joe and his team for putting this on. Um, before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the Native people. The land that I'm speaking to you from is um, Central California. Native peoples before me were the Esalen and the Rumsian Indians, and I'd just like to do a shout out to them. Thank you for letting us be here. Um, and I'm gonna, um, I'm excited that we're gonna jump in this journey. We're gonna start in the ocean, like all life, and then we'll go to land and we'll end up in your closet. So how's that gonna happen? Well, let me share my screen and we'll get right to it. Okay. Okay. All righty. Okay, so, um, so I am a marine biologist by training and have spent a lot of time underwater in the ocean, born here in California, not too far from, um, um, from where I live now, near San Francisco. And I used to go to the beach with my parents. They made glued this little wetsuit together and I wouldn't take it off because it would rip all my hair off. So I spent a lot of time in the ocean and um, studied marine biology and became smitten, as Joe mentioned, with this crazy fish, the ocean sunfish, in graduate school. And I spent many years following it around. It's taken me all sorts of places from the Galapagos Islands, um, California, Bali, Cape Town, South Africa, just to name a few. But, and I love this work, I love being in the ocean. Um, but the more time you spend in the ocean, the more you realize how much pollution we're pouring into it and, and the very real and detrimental effects of that. So this is a photo from Pemutran, which is in the north, um, northwest part of Bali, Indonesia, where I helped start a National Geographic student expedition in the summers. And it's a beautiful place, except when the rains pour all this trash down onto the beach, um, kind of a microcosm of what happens around the world. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure, um, you know, so much of the trash in our ocean is plastic and it collects and concentrates other pollutants on it. So leaching out its own, not just its own nasty chemicals, but the pollutants that it's, that it's gathered. And sea creatures eat this, mistake it for food and get sick. Um, some creatures try to make the best of it, like this little hermit crab that I found in um, Belize on another student expedition, trying to make its home in this pen cap and having a devil of a time pulling that thing around. Plus it gets very hot, much hotter than the normal little shells that they take up residence in. So um, so the problem with, you know, the problem with this plastics is that they don't degrade. Um, they just break down into inedible bits that don't go away. And so now it's crazy, we have, 500 times more pieces of plastic in the ocean than there are stars in our galaxy. We've got about, you know, 500 billion stars in the Milky Way alone. So that's a whole lot of plastic and it's just going up. So a lot of those little plastic um, bits are actually microfibers. 
And where do those come from? Well, if you take a sneak peek right now at what you're wearing and look at your clothing label, you might see that it's made of nylon, polyester, acrylic. If any of those ingredients are in your clothing, those are made from fossil fuels. And it's petroleum that we're wrapping ourselves in, knitting ourselves um, into. And that sheds into the ocean, as Joe was saying. 60% of what we wear is made from plastic. Um, and so, so that's, um, that's, the, that's the problem. Our, our closets are leaking this pollution. Our, our washing machines are leaking this pollution into the ocean. So you ever wonder why those, um, you know, our, <laughs> those fleece that are so soft and cuddly, why they're so soft? Well, the polyester fibers they're made from are frayed and frazzled at the ends. It makes them very soft, but it also weakens them. So when we wash them, they break quite easily and they shed, get into the water stream. They also come out of our dryer, our dryer vents. Um, <clears throat> actually, you know, three times more fibers come out of our dryer vents than our washing machines. And we're just putting this all into the atmosphere, into the water, into our soils, and eventually that's getting into, into us. There was a new study, it just came out a couple days ago by some colleagues of mine, Matt um, Savoka, and his, um, here, who's based here in Hopkins Marine Station. Over 386 marine species of fish have been found to have plastic in them, 210 of those being commercially important species. So, and that number, that number has gone up. It's quadrupled since the last time such a census was made by the United Nations in 2016. That number of fish species who have plastic in them has quadrupled. Um, <clears throat> sharks, groupers, other fishes, those are the ones that are more likely to ingest plastic. So they're, they're higher at risk. So plastic, <laughs> it's not the fish, just the fish that are eating it. We eat the fish. We also um, get plastics in our salt, table salt, in our crops. So it's what's for dinner. It's affecting us. We're eating our own waste. Um, at this point, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, what can we do? This is so horrible. <laughs> um, but there's a lot we can do. We can, I've become increasingly interested in our clothing. And, you know, what about cotton? You may be thinking, well, cotton's organic. Maybe that's the way to go. But the one thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about fabrics and we're thinking about our clothing is that it resides in a larger ecosystem. And cotton, let's take, it's a good example. For example, um, cotton is so, is so desirable a fabric, um, the demand for it actually has led to the, to the death of the Aral Sea. So much water was diverted to grow cotton um, at such large scale that the, the Aral Sea just, um, you know, has whittled down to nothing. It used to be uh, the fourth largest lake in the world. And so, so within, within this world of fabrics is a whole ecosystem of manufacturing and resource extraction that needs to be taken into account. Um, and so if you want to really find the sustainable fabrics, the, the right kinds of fabrics to wear that are less impactful on the planet, you have to think about how that fabric is in, in this large eco ecosystem, its effect on the environment, the economy, and sustainability. So, you know, with the environment, how is its extraction affecting air and water and land pollution? And then socially, how is it affecting the people who are picking the cotton or extracting the resources? And do they have, do they have fair wages? Are they being treated fairly? A big buzzword in the industry is circular, thinking about a circular economy. Um, that we have to, when you, when a fabric goes out there, you have to, whoever's creating it needs to design with the next stage in mind. Um, in theory, it's really not that complicated, you know? Um, just look at mother nature. When something dies in the wild, like say a redwood tree, this beautiful one I photographed just the other day up in Northern California, when it decomposes, it releases all sorts of nutrients and that benefit the life around it and allow the life around it to thrive. Um, it's called a nurse log. 
for that for that very reason. So that's just what we need to think about when we're creating fabrics, when we're creating anything, is what is the life cycle of that product? And when it goes through one stage, can it be can it benefit another stage? When it starts to to break down, can it break down in a way that its component parts can be find, you know, re-enter the cycle of utility? So this um this whole idea of circular economy and sustainable fabrics has um really gotten me interested in looking for other kinds of fabrics out there that are made from different materials. And then and that's I've embarked on this this fun adventure with my National Geographic colleague Carol Dunham, as well as a host of other explorers like M. Jackson, Elizabeth Lindsay, David Heck, Maria Fadiman, Grace Gobo, and and many and many more. You know, there's so many different kinds of plants that make um, that you can make fabric from. For instance, you know, from the um, stems of flax and hemp and nettle and lotus, you can get fabric from the leaves of bananas and pineapples, from the seed hair of coconuts. Aslan fibers come from soy protein waste. You can get um, from the seed pods of, of seba trees, you get kapok. Sisal um, comes from the stems of agave plants. It's actually in the in the core of the of the um, cables that run the San Francisco cable cars too. Have a core of sisal. So all sorts of really interesting fabrics out there. Um, and there's this whole biofabrication revolution that's happening right now with materials in laboratories and manufacturing firms across the world. In Sweden, there's a great group called Renew Cell that takes old discarded clothing and makes it into a slurry um, to extract new material called circulose. Um, actually, I just had a FedEx delivery from Modern Meadow who makes bio alloy fabric, a vegan kind of leather taking the animal out of the equation. And Bolt Threads, based up in um, San Francisco Bay Area, um, make a vegan leather out of mycelia, fungus. There's, there's an amazing group based out of Japan called Spiber that's brewing protein from, from yeast and creating spider silk proteins. Um, they actually just are opening up a hundred million dollar company in Clinton, Iowa. So really interesting, innovative work happening all over the world to try and figure out how to reduce our fabric footprint and, and keep a circular economy in mind. So all the energy that's going into creating the and the, the fabrics is renewable and all these all these boxes to check. <laughs> and there's a bunch of big companies getting in on this because they hear their consumers wanting to to lower their environmental footprint and wanting to buy clothing that makes them feel good and doesn't make them feel like they're contributing to the problem. So so there's definitely big movement afoot with some of the big companies. Um, here are some of the brands that have, have made some strong pledges to, to buy fabric that is more sustainable. Certainly Patagonia leads the way. They've been definitely um, deeply into the research of this. Allbirds, Pangaea, all sorts of Koyuchi, all sorts of companies are now seeing that this is what customers want. And so your your choices of what you buy in the store really make a difference. Um, if this is something you're interested in, there's there's no shortage of, of materials to, to look into. Whenever I get really depressed about plastic pollution, I just log into Biomarket Insights. And um, there's always new, amazing um, discoveries being made and being posted in there. There's a great... Um, online magazine called Selvage Textile Exchange. There's an app that Nike put out where you can see the, the environmental footprint of various different fabrics. And then here are some of the books I've just been reading, really fascinating, that take you on these incredible journeys through time. How, you know, cotton was in, involved in, in the spread of Islam and how banking came from textile trading. And it's just amazing how much 
textiles and fabrics have been so interwoven, pun intended, with the course of human history. So endlessly fascinating. So, you know, we buy about 100 billion pieces of clothing a year. And I don't think we really need to. We never used to do that. We buy 70% more clothing than we ever did, um, you know, 30 years ago. And so we can make a big difference as individuals. We can think before we buy. Do we really need that piece of clothing? We can look at that label, buy clothes that last, not that they're just throwaways. Do clothing swaps, rewear your clothes. You don't have to wash them all the time. And when you do wash them, you know, um, you can, you don't have to dry them. You can hang dry them. So that makes them last longer. Treat your clothes well. Um, so, so this is a project. Um, I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the name of it is that I'm, this is the name of our adventure around the world in 80 fabrics our adventure in textiles, searching for sustainable fashion. And at the core of our, our project is we're making a teaching quilt. We're having um, samples sent to us from all around the world. We're sewing it together. And with that, we're going to be having an app and a book and um, photographing the makers. Every piece of fabric has a story and a face behind it. So it's, um, it's such an exciting journey that we're on. Um, we're going to, you know, everything from profiling indigenous um, makers, and and it's good this is a women blaze trails because so much of the textile industry, especially um, with weaving and fabrics, is women driven, women collectives. Um, so we're putting a face behind the fabrics, um, going from indigenous communities all the way into the late breaking, state of the art, lab grown materials. So I really welcome you to join us on our journey at Around the World in 80 Fabrics. Um, you can find us on Instagram. We're just starting this journey. It's going to be about a five-year journey as we gather fabrics from around the world and stitch together this quilt and these stories. And um, it, it's aimed to be a museum exhibit. So just a couple last um, before I wrap it up. And I want to show you some of the fabrics we've been gathering. Um, that there, you know, there's a bunch of different things you can do for, for um, you know, like I, like I, I mentioned, you know, be, be good to your clothes. You don't have to buy so many of them and be cognizant of what you're buying and treat them well. Treat them like you want them to last. Because um, remember, what we wear ends up out there. And I, my, my big hope, you know, my big dream in doing this project is, is that we do raise awareness and, um, and that my kids, you know, realize that, that they, can, they can say to me, you know, mommy, remember when we were little and the planet was drowning in plastic pollution? Boy, are we glad that we cleaned up our act. So <laughs> that's, my, that's my dream. Um, so right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just, um, I'm gonna shop, stop sharing my screen and show you some fabrics. Okay, all righty, so I'm back. Um, so can you see me? Okay, so here are some of these cool fabrics that come in. And actually this, <laughs> this one just came in FedEx as we were speaking, it just, um, it just came in. This is a vegan, a vegan leather made from a bio alloy that just came in from Modern Meadow. So it's hard to show these things on internet, but, but there's a little piece of it there. This is an incredible fabric that's made from lotus roots. And, um, and oh, it's very, very fine. It's believed to be one of the most spiritually sacred fibers because only the Buddha would wear it. But now women collectives are making it in, in Siem Reap in Cambodia, in Myanmar, and um, making good livings with lotus fibers. We have, um, we have tapas, which is quintessential Polynesian fabric made from the bark of mulberry trees. Um, we have kapok. Kapok is another um, you know, seed pod fabric, very soft, warmer than wool. And um, this is from, this is uh, from Cambodia. Wild nettle fabric from, um, 
<laughs> from the Himalayas, made from nettles. And you thought nettles were just those annoying things that stung you. This is one of my favorite ones, which is going to make a, an incredible story. Um, it's made from kivyut, which is the down of musk ox. And the musk ox actually sheds this fiber. Um, it sheds its coat up to five pounds each animal. And then the, um, in Greenland and Alaska, the people gather the kivyut and they sew it together. We interviewed a woman, I, um, Elaine Mosier, who sewed this one in this diamond pattern, which is um, reminiscent of the ice flows coming together and cracking. And she she um, has moved to Anchorage, but her, her little village where she learned to weave and she would do this is going underwater. And she said that she, you know, her home was a hundred yards from the ocean and now it's 30. So these are also stories of, of climate change, of um, environmental impacts and, um, and, and, and certainly the, the fabrics we're getting from the polar regions are telling that story. So, and here's another one made of dog fur, used to make dog, um, dog hair, not having to kill the dog, just dog hair, not dog fur, sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll wrap it up and answer any questions, but um, you can tell I'm excited. There's so much more to tell. And so we're just, <laughs> there's a lot more to tell. Wow, well, you're getting stocks down. down, lotus root. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Very innovative solutions. And, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of them coming from indigenous communities, which is another amazing part of the story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and talking to the talking to these people, it's just, you know, amazing the change they've seen. And um, it's a very, it's it's one of the oldest crafts, you know, weaving, it dates back 5,000, you know, 6,000 years that we find woven fabric. And so it's just e even more than that. Um, and and so it's been this, it's, it's really held humanity together. So it's able to tell quite a changing story. Yeah. Well, we have a question right away here in the chat. This is from Joni. Uh, and they're wondering, is there a resource where they could find out about more of these fabrics? Where should they go? Yeah, well, so so that was um, some of the things I put the textile exchange was was one of those, um, you know, um, we're, we're going to be that's that's essentially what we're doing is putting this together on our website as well. Selvage has um it has a great, um, if you're into sort of the natural fibers, it's an online magazine. Um, I, I really recommend some of the books I put up, The Fabric of Civilization, as well as The Golden Thread. Yeah. All right, some good resources. Yeah. So this brings another question, wondering about how, how much access there is to these fabrics at this moment in time. Could someone in a rural area get access to them? Are they, you know, affordable, more expensive? Yeah, and I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that was brought up because often, you know, like with organic food, um, it's more expensive, and you want to democratize the access to these fabrics. And fast fashion has caught on because it is so cheap in the short term, but not in the long term. So, I mean, I think all these things are are on the minds of people creating the fabrics of the future. Is how do we make these fabrics affordable? and um, not price them out so they become some elitist endeavor as opposed to trying to clothe the masses. So, so it's, you know, it's a work in process. Right now, a lot of these organic fabrics are more expensive. Like, like for instance, this, and, and some of them are experimental. Um, like this one, you know, it's made from seaweed, seaweed and cotton. And it was, it was like $80 and it's a t-shirt, you know. So, <laughs> so, so, um, that's something that I'm really hoping is that, is that we can democratize, um, access to, to, to less harmful fabrics and that that's part of that whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's worth, you know, paying a little bit more for something that is going to have less of a footprint on the environment and, you know, kind of forces you to think, do I really need 
20 t-shirts in my closet when, you know, less could do. Um, yeah, Joe, I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing. We're, we're led to believe that we need to buy a new piece of clothing every week it is what it actually adds up to is that we're buying a new piece of clothing every other day if you average it out. Um, and, and some of us more, some of us less, but, but we need to buy stuff that lasts longer. And if you pay a little bit more, it's, you know, in the long run, it's better to have fewer clothes that last longer than just a whole closet of clothes that you're not wearing that are going to end up in the landfill. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We have some students who are tuning in and they're curious about some things they could do to, um, you know, lessen their plastic impact. What are some suggestions that you have? Yeah, yeah. Well, since I'm sort of tracking out on the on the clothing, <laughs> I would say, you know, really, really look at your labels, buy less clothing, be really careful about how you wash your clothes. Um, um, you don't have to dry all your clothes because that really weakens them, especially your your fleeces. Um, <clears throat> so try to try to wash those in cold wa washing cold water that saves energy as well. Um, don't wash things like, like your jeans and your shoes in with your soft stuff. So, so how you treat your clothes makes a big difference and what you choose to wear. Um, because that is a boat, that's a billboard of your values. Um, and by, um, and, and, you know, you can, you can share how you feel about what clothing is doing by, by changing what you wear and sharing that with your friends. And that has an impact. So. All right. Well, I'm going to share this one more time. Uh, if people at home want to follow along on this adventure around the world, looking at fabrics, uh, there's the Instagram uh, handle right there. You can follow along. And then Tierney, I think right before we sign off, I should plug our other festival that you and I are teaming up for that's coming up <laughs> soon. Yes, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. So um, we started, I started off my talk with that crazy fish, the ocean sunfish, which is near and dear to my heart. I've been studying them for over 30 years. And the first ever virtual ocean sunfish symposium is happening on February 23rd. Um, it's a celebration of a book that we put out, um, the first big academic book on the ocean sunfish, which I say has has risen to the top of the charts as the number one selling ocean sunfish academic book. It's because it's the only one, <laughs> but, but um, it's good, it's good. And, um, and it's just a great group of people who um, I've been working with to put it together. And it's gonna be so much fun because we're adding in a bunch of art as well, art and hey, science. It's always good to be number one, so. <laughs> Yeah. You're gonna um, only the one. <laughs> yeah. So there's the the website there. It's a landing page right now, but early Monday through Tuesday, uh, you'll see that change to a full website with uh, the lineup and registration and hope to see people tuning in to learn about the amazing sunfish, the mola. Sunfish, yes, the mola. Yeah, I would love to see you guys there. All right. Well, Tierney, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for taking us on a uh whirlwind tour of some really cool uh, fabrics from traditional to uh, experimental, really neat. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you, Joe, for putting it on, an amazing festival, yeah. All right, well, thank you, Tierney, and we will catch up soon. Okay, see you later, bye, everybody. All right.